Well, this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at the next of our close encounters. People who encountered Jesus uh, close up, face to face, and the differences that those made. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, getting out of the boat and Peter's experience uh, with encountering Jesus on the waters in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, today, we're going to be looking uh, to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. But the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You pray with me. Father, we do thank you that, uh, that we can come to your word and that your spirit can speak to us in new ways and there can be such depth in the things that we can find there that Lord, there could, we could have read things over and over again and have missed incredible truths uh, that were right in front of us. And we pray this morning that not only would we see new things and intellectually hear new things, but we would understand Lord, how that affects our encountering you, how it affects redemption, uh, with you, and Lord, how it affects we share uh, who you are with others. We pray that your spirit would be a part of us understanding and that it would be changed, even through such a simple story of, as the encounter of Jesus when he met Zacchaeus. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So if you grew up in church, you probably might have known that song before. Who here, before they heard uh, uh the Pa from Veggie Tales singing the song has heard uh, the Zacchaeus song before. Raise your hand. All right. It's a, it's a song that children have sung forever. So if you have led children or been a child in the church, you probably have heard that song one day or another. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Climbed up in a sycamore tree, and the Lord he wanted to see. And as a master passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. It's a song that we've all sung, we, or many of us have sung, and uh, many of us know by heart, and probably you will be humming it this afternoon. You're welcome. But this is one encounter with Jesus that was much more than simply that simple children's song. It's a vivid picture of how Jesus saved people, how God saves people not only back then, but how God saves people today. So I want to spend some time digging a little bit deeper into the scripture. First of all, the account of Zacchaeus' uh, the account of Zacchaeus' encounter with Christ is found only in the Gospel of Luke. So everything we know about Zacchaeus is found in that short passage we just read for scripture today in the passage of Luke. But there are some things that are important to know that we can identify right away about Zacchaeus and Jesus from the things we are told and what we know about the Bibli about history of that time and how the Jewish people would have worked and thought. To begin with, we are told that Zacchaeus was a chief amongst the tax collectors, which is about the worst thing that you could have been uh, in, in Jesus' time. In the eyes of the Jewish, Jewish people, uh, he would have been seen as someone who had turned traitor. Zacchaeus would have been seen as someone who had been considered a hated sinner, and there's good reason why. Does anyone know who, at that time that, uh, that Jesus had met Zacchaeus, who was in control 
of Israel, of the Jewish people? Which country, which empire would have been in control? The race. Yeah, many of you know. We're actually going to be uh, doing our, our dinner theater where we have the Roman centurions, and it's the story of one of the Roman centurions. It's because they were in control, and it wasn't because the Jewish people had said, hey, come on in, take control. They were a conquered people. And so it was the equivalent to, let's say, us in Canada, if World War II had gone a different way, if Germany had taken control. Now, I'm not equating the Roman Empire with Germany, but they were a conquered people. They were under rule of another nation that had taken away their own freedom. That meant that their money was, uh, was taxed by the Roman Empire for the purposes of the Roman Empire. And so when Zacchaeus, we are told, is a chief tax collector, he is not only someone who collected money for the enemy, but he was one of the guys that headed it up. People would have seen him as a hated sinner, a traitor. He would have been seen as colluding with the enemy. Although people would have held back their responses to the Roman Empire, I'm sure they had no problem telling Zacchaeus how they felt about him. And the tax collectors, it was even worse than that, would earn some of their money by pocketing a portion of that money they were collecting from the Roman Empire. We are told Zacchaeus was not only a tax collector, but he was a wealthy tax collector. He was collecting for the Roman Empire, but doing well on the side on his own. He was considered dishonest by those around him. And I'm sure his parents wouldn't have thought of Zacchaeus that way. Everyone, one thing I've learned when I worked with youth and young adults is everyone thinks their kids are wonderful. No matter who your kids are, most parents today think their kids are wonderful. I'll have little Johnny stab little Jane in the with a pencil, and it'll be the wheat that caused it. I'm sure that he ate earlier in the day. We know that Zacchaeus' parents thought of him in a different way because of his name. Zacchaeus literally means pure or righteous. And I can imagine his parents, when he was born, holding him, looking down at their baby, and having high hopes for where Zacchaeus would go and who he would be, and naming him with a name that meant purity and righteousness. And yet somewhere along the way, things went awry, as it does in many of our lives. Somewhere along the line, Zacchaeus would have taken a bad turn towards selfishness, and it began to characterize his life. But eventually, all of that changed. As we look into the story of Zacchaeus, we're going to take a closer look into that scripture as we read and see how that change came about. So there's a number of things we can see as we look carefully at the scripture. First of all, we go to verse 3. We're told he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. The first point is, was that Zacchaeus went looking to see who Jesus was. Zacchaeus went looking to see who Jesus was. Many people today talk about religions and they talk about uh, faith as something that uh, they've explored. But the truth is that most people who say stuff like that really have never actually gone looking to see what is true, to, to actually gone looking to see who Jesus was. People within our culture talk about Jesus and what he taught, and all they know is a surface understanding. They've never really gone to see who Jesus was. Zacchaeus did something interesting. Instead of hearing from a distance about who Jesus was and from others, he decided he wanted to know himself who Jesus was. So he got up and went to find Jesus so he could observe him himself and make his own decisions on Jesus, on who Jesus was. I have good friends who've spent most of their life dabbling in the spiritual in spiritual things. In fact, a lot of their friends have done that as well. But might have never stopped to look at what is real or true. We never really looked to see who Jesus is. There's an amazing thing that Zacchaeus did that began his uh, journey towards redemption. He went to look for who Jesus is. The people often respond, and, and when they are are brought with that idea of God wanting us to go and look for who he is and say, 
Well, God has made himself difficult to find. God has hidden himself. And that's a general misconception out there is that, well, what about, what about in this situation? What about where people don't grow up in a Christian family? My dad recently, we were having a good conversation about some of this stuff. And he goes, he goes, yeah, I was talking uh, to um, some people who were visited, knocked on his door to share some things. And uh, in that process, my dad goes, well, you grew up here, so that's what you believe. And I grew up here, so that's what I believe. And he goes, it really goes to the house that you grew up in. And it kind of is that sharing that under underlying idea that you can't actually find God and search him out and see what he who he actually is. But scripture doesn't treat it that way. The scripture doesn't treat it as God has hidden himself from us. And the amazing thing is, if you really look around the world and talk to people, not just in Canada, but around the world, it's surprising how God makes himself known. Not too many years ago, I went to Lebanon. Before things went out of control with Syria and all of that, it was a safer place to go visit. So I went with a bunch of ministers. Uh, we spent a lot of time with in all sections. There's uh, The government's div divided up into the Christian uh, section and then two Muslim sections, which are kind of opposing. And we, we spent a lot of our time visiting in different areas and talking to people. And one of the amazing things I didn't expect to find when I got there was how God was working. Not within the Christian section, but how people were coming to Christ uh, to, in the Muslim world. And he, God was doing it with dream, in dreams. I, I uh, began talking to some of uh, the former Muslims who had come to Christ that way, and God had been, Jesus had been appearing to them in dreams, and they had been led in incredible ways to find Jesus. And uh, I was like, well, why would God do that here, but not in Canada? And they went on, we went got on to talk about it, and they were people who were ministering within their world, the, uh, within Lebanon, and they go, yeah, here. He goes, if people, if Jesus didn't approach them that way, those people would have been cut off completely from hearing who he was. So those people who went looking, wanted to know, Jesus said, okay, fine, I'm going to come to you and show you who I am. And he would appear in dreams. One of the gentlemen at the school that I was uh, talking to, he actually said that his great-grandfather had uh, been a Bedouin. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's a, a people within their world that would actually move within the desert from place to place. They would never be set down in one spot. So, uh, and they would, you might see them in old movies with, you know, a nice big blade on their side. And he was saying, well, my great, great grandfather, uh, he actually one day had this man in white appear in a vision to him. And the man told him to get up and go to this big city uh, a couple hundred miles away. So he got up and he walked there. And when he got to that city, he goes, the, uh, he was led to this one cafe and this one man sitting at this uh, cafe where, uh, and I'm sure the cafe would be a lot different than our cafes, but it was led to this one man. And he didn't engage the man, he just stood back and watched it. And then when the man was finished eating and having his coffee, he got up and left. And his great-grandfather, who was a Bedouin, followed that man home. It would be kind of scary if you were that man. The man didn't recognize it, though, didn't see it. Eventually, he got back to his home, went inside, sat down, and the Bedouin great-grandfather waited for a while. And then finally walked up to the door, feeling this vision who had spoken to him, was telling him to go and speak to this man, and knocked on the door. And the man did not come to the door, his wife did. And she screamed, because there was a man who was a Bedouin with a large knife on his side, standing there. And her husband's reaction was actually quite good. He said, it's all right, dear, invite him in. And the story went on to say that that Bedouin great-grandfather uh, was led to Christ there. The man who God had led him hundreds of miles to go meet in a coffee shop to a vision, a dream, was actually the first missionary to the Muslims in that area, in that part of the world. His family, eventually, the, the, the Bedouin tribe, not only came to know Christ, many of them, uh, but God did that again a couple generations later. And that's how this young man ended up as a, as a minister. 
And he was saying, he goes, this is normal here. Because it may not be in North America, but God's doing incredible things and reaching people. And that's just one way he's done it. I know that there are people in the church everywhere today who know things about God. But it's important that we take that step and ask the question, God, if you're real, I want to know you. Who are you? We need to go and take that initial step. Part of that process of finding God is actually wanting to find God. There's a point where we go, okay, if you're real, I want to know who you are. I had a young lady um, just about a year ago uh, come to me and I said I was explaining what it meant to know Christ. She goes, I just don't want to know. I go, have you asked God if he's real? And uh, she was only in town for a couple of weeks. She had been a student in my ministry years ahead. And uh, she actually came crying after service. The next week she had come to church and she goes, he's real. And she was shocked. And I go, I know, isn't it awesome? And she, she had said, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And she had just... She just taken that step to say, God, I want to look to see if you're real. And she was shocked to find out that he really was, that he answered her and that he was real. And it changed her life. She's a believer now. She, she had been living in the, uh, the Arab Emirates and, uh, you know, and been hundreds, well, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And there was no way I could see how God was going to, you know, help her grow and as a Christian. Uh, but God took care of all of that. But it was all because she took the initial step of saying, God, are you real? And if you are, I want to know you. So that's the first point. Zacchaeus went looking to see who Jesus was. The second point is, Jesus already knew who Zacchaeus was uh, before Zacchaeus met you. In the uh, verse number five, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. It's an incredible piece of information there that we get about how Jesus works, about how God works. Had Jesus met Zacchaeus before? No. They weren't close to each other. Uh, we're not told that anyone told Jesus, that guy way over there, his name is Zacchaeus. There's this habit Jesus has of knowing things about people before they've ever met him. He actually says to Zacchaeus, he says, calls him by name. He doesn't go, hey, you up in the tree. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must go to your house today. He knew Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus ever went looking for who Jesus was. Now, I want to be clear about that. Not only had Jesus not met him to this point, uh, but we need to ask, we need to be clear about how Jesus knew Zacchaeus. People go, well, Jesus knows everything. He's the Son of God. And the, but the truth is, Jesus talked over and over and over again. And even in this passage, he finishes off by saying, the Son of Man has come. Because he wants us to know that when he lived, he lived just like us. He didn't know everything on his own. He had li he, although he was the Son of God, he had limited himself to be like us. When he prayed, it wasn't different than when we prayed. He had the same access that we have. That he, uh, though he was sinless, he didn't, he wasn't omniscient. He didn't know everything. He didn't know everything about everybody. But we have this pattern over and over again of Jesus knowing. And he gives us a hint as to how that happens. He tells us that he only does what he sees his father doing. There was a process that Jesus would be in conversation all the time. He called it prayer. You might know this thing. Prayer. He was in prayer with his father. He was talking with his father. And when he needed to know things, his father would speak to him. And say, this guy over here, his name is Zacchaeus. You need to go to you. You need to go to his house today. And Jesus would do it because his father would have shown him, and he knew things about Zacchaeus. He probably his father had probably shown him things about um, about Zacchaeus's needs. You might even have experienced that yourself in your own life, where someone comes to you and says, as someone did to me this morning, and said, God has told me to pray for you today, and. I came to my office to pray for me, specifically today. And they had come when I thought, Lord, I need prayer. And God had spoken to them and sent them to me. God does that. And that's how Jesus had known. 
The great news is, that's how Jesus was on earth. But practically, we don't deal with limited Jesus anymore. God knows us. God knows you. You see that about God within this encounter with Zacchaeus. Not only does he know your name, he knows everything about you. And in that process of coming and redemption, we know this truth about God that he actually knows all about us. He, Jesus, God knows Jody. He knows my failings. He knows my history. He knows what, what sins need to be forgiven. He knows all of that. He not only knows my name, but he knows me. And he knows me better than I do. When my children were young, I could remember times that I would catch them doing something wrong. They were still at the age when they didn't realize that parents had special powers and could tell when they were lying. You didn't, parents, you know this? You've experienced this, right? And they, they would try to convince you, uh, that they, that they actually hadn't done the thing and you would just go along with it knowing, uh, what they had done. I want to just put a picture up here. This is a, a picture of a child, a video on YouTube, but you might or might not have seen it yet. This child was trying, in the video, is trying to convince his parents that he did not eat the cupcake. And his parents are talking to him saying, so you didn't eat a cupcake? No, no, I didn't. Not even one? No. And he thinks he's fooled them because he's convincingly avoided admitting that it's happened. But he had icing all around his mouth the whole time. And they knew all along. Sometimes I think that I approach God like that. I come to God going, if I don't talk about it, you won't know. You know, you know what I mean? And I don't mean like, I don't mean like seriously, but part of my heart is like, if I can keep avoiding talking about the areas I struggle in, God won't really have to deal with it because he doesn't know. And all the time God's looking at me, really? I know, you know, I know, buddy. Joey, come on. It's time to talk about this. So first of all, uh, we have Zacchaeus looking for Jesus. Secondly, that Jesus knew Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus ever came. And that's how we approach God. That if we actually look for him, we need to know that we're, when we're coming to, to God, we're not going to surprise him with our sin. He's already known. If we feel like we're failing and whatever, yeah, God, it's not new news to God. We're coming it's more about a change in our heart than it is about any change in God. Number three. I'm going to read the passage first. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked at him, up him, at, to him, uh, looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Number three. Jesus invited himself in. Zacchaeus simply responded. Jesus invited himself in. The, the uh, process of re redeeming, of uh, fixing the relationship between God and Zacchaeus didn't begin with Zacchaeus going, I have a plan for fixing things. It began with God going, hey, I need to come to your house. How would you welcome me in? And Zacchaeus, all he did with that invitation was go, okay, I, I accept. Come on in. Welcome. And that isn't a picture just found here, but it's, uh, because it goes on to say, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. But later, in Revelation 3.20, we have this pattern for how God works with us. Sound familiar? Jesus saying, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I eat with that person and they with me. This verse is just filled with God saying, I have made the, initi the in initiative. I'm at your door knocking, and if you let me in, because I don't come in, I don't force my way in. If you let me in, I will come in, and I'm going to spend time in relationship with you, which is for the Jewish people, for the for people of Jesus' time in all nations, eating together was important. Even now, we know that. That's why we do Alpha with food, and that's why as Baptists, we, we do food all the time. We know that the best relationship building times are times we sit around together with people 
And when we sit over meals and talk, those are incredible family building times, neighbor building times. And in Jesus' time, he said, I will come in and eat with you. I will spend time in relationship with you. And then you will be able to with me too. On the cross, Jesus had provided that way for us to be forgiven, to have that relationship with God. But it was always a free gift. It was not something that was free to be purchased, but Jesus offers it to us, saying, I've done this, and I offer this to you. I'm at your door knocking. But it still requires that we let him in, that we surrender and turn things over. Number four. We've already said this before, but we have to come back here. Zacchaeus was a sinner. People recognize that. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner, we're told in that passage. People got upset that Jesus hung out with a sinner. People were furious, They were, but they were missing the whole point. They were all sinners. Everyone who was going, oh my word, he's eating with a the sinner, they recognized his, uh, Zacchaeus' sin as being worse than all theirs. But the whole religious system they worked within of sacrifice for their sins pointed to the fact that they were all sinners, that everyone had failings and needed to be forgiven. So when they got all upset about it, they were just putting levels. They were saying, oh, he's working with someone who's really bad. He's spending time with, with someone who's so much worse than us. But that isn't the way Jesus saw things. I like the description of the church as that of a hospital. Full of people who are broken. We are a bunch of sinners. I don't, I wouldn't say go say that to all your neighbors, right? Like quite like that. They'll go, yeah, my church, we're a bunch of sinners. It's, you know, it's not like come have a great time. We're a bunch of sinners. It's, we are all a bunch of people who have, are flawed and broken. And, uh, yeah, the, that when you look, that's, that's the people that should be at the church. But there's an incredible thing that we find here as well. You have this amazing doctor who brings life to the, what's that? The great physician, exactly. The one who has come to bring healing. I, lately I've heard people, just since being here at Lower Coverdale, I've heard people make jokes about stepping into the church and they said, oh, I went into the church, it was amazing, the building didn't fall down on me. Or I didn't burst into flame. And I'm like, what in the world? I go, well, that, that's a complete misconception of what the church is. Everyone in the church you know, is in that same boat as someone from off the street coming in. We are all uh, sinful. We are all, you know, broken. That person, the people who said those things, both of them were people who felt incredibly unworthy. And they were right. We are unworthy. So is everyone else. And that's the point. That is why Jesus came. The church is just a bunch of unworthy people loved and forgiven by God. We see that in how Jesus chose to go to Zacchaeus, and everyone got all upset about how he was a sinner. Next passage. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus' response to Jesus is something that we don't always talk about, but it's a part of redemption. It's, the, it's a part of what Jesus expected, and what he described. His, his process, his response to Jesus was not simply to say, yes, come on in, but it, it had this transforming effect where he said, I'm changing direction. We call it repentance within the church. That's our church word for it. But it means to turn from what we've been doing in the opposite direction. We can see it in Zacchaeus' actions, not in his only in his words. He, he didn't say, Jesus, I feel really bad about this. But he said, I'm doing things differently. In fact, I've been stealing from these people. I've been skimming off the top of money. I'm going to give them four times back what I've taken. It wasn't, Jesus didn't require that of him. It was simply a natural response to repentance. He said, I want to go in a completely different direction. And that is what salvation really looks like. That is what redemption really looks like. Sometimes we only focus on the forgiveness of our Savior, but when Jesus called people, he always called them to two things. You probably heard Jesus described as Savior a lot. 
there's a word that we often say, something and Savior. Does anyone know what that word is? Lord, right. We always call him Lord and Savior. And Lord isn't a, isn't a foreign word. People know what a Lord is. It's someone who rules or is in control. And for Jesus, coming to know him as Savior also meant saying, I surrender. I sur well, you were singing this earlier. I surrender all of who I am. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but it does mean that there is a general decision in our heart that God is first place. And after that, everything else is sort of under his rule. Jesus called himself Lord and Savior. People called him Lord and Savior, and they go together. Jesus talks about taking up our cross and following him. To follow Jesus, there needs to be a willingness to surrender control and decide that he will be the Lord of our lives. Right, and it's an amazing thing. We find that when we give up all that stuff and we surrender, we find that everything we've given up becomes better. That Jesus comes in and having him Lord is much better than being Lord of our own life. For Jesus, repentance was always a part of salvation. Number six, Jesus came to save the lost. Those first parts are all about the redemptive process. But as we look at Zacchaeus' story, we see Jesus saying at the end, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. And we know from the rest of Scripture that in the New Testament that people who, being a son of Abraham, meant that you actually trusted by faith in God's saving work in your life. He was saying that this man has believed and come to know me. And then he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This last point simply speaks to the fact that those of us who might already know Jesus, to those of us who already might know Jesus in that way in our lives, maybe we already have redemption in our lives, we're given a picture of what Jesus was here to do, what it was important to Jesus, and the things that are important to Jesus should be important to us as the church, that he had come to save uh, to seek and save the lost. That Jesus was driven by love for those who had met him yet. And he went looking for them. And his goal was that they would find forgiveness. That they would be saved. That should be the driving force behind, underneath everything we do as a church. That we are to be a people who go to know others and love them. And when we, that we loving them means caring for them, getting to know them, spending time eating with them and talking with them, that we're like Jesus. We go, yes, I'd love to come to your house. Or, hey, I'm inviting you. I mean, Jesus didn't have a house, but we could say, come on in. I've got a house. Come on in. Come eat with me. We are to be excited about sharing the difference that Jesus has made in our lives with others so that they might meet the same Lord and Savior who has moved in our lives. Too. When we come to Zacchaeus, it's amazing to see all the hidden things that are there that speak about how God really works. They applied to Zacchaeus back then, but they applied to us today. We bow and pray with you. Dear God, we thank you that even in this one account of this short guy uh, who was off track and that you went to his house, that God, there's so much more to that story of how you knew him ahead and he sought after you and just that decision to ask that God you respond uh, that you made yourself know him that in that you actually knew him already and you made it clear to him you probably were shocked father to hear uh, his name from your lips God we thank you that that is true in our lives too that you know us God we thank you that not only do you know us uh, but you uh, call us to open up and let you in to surrender and then when we do that when we repent that you come and eat with us and God, as your church, we have this incredible good news to share with the world around us. That you have come to seek and to save the lost. And we are part of that lost. God, we pray that as we look forward to who we are to be as your church, that we are motivated by your desire. That you spent all your time teaching, and a lot of that time teaching and healing was to share your love with the world that didn't hang out at church. God, we pray that we would be the type of people uh, that want to be loving people that you love and loving them in the way that you do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.